Hey everybody, welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast and another Q&A episode. I'm Molly Herford. I write about all things fitness and outdoors related. Recently developed a deep love of bike packing and also am midway through yoga teacher training, so feeling very bendy. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and endurance coach. I mostly work with masters or age groupers, um, but I do a little bit with everyone depending on what they need and especially if they need some movement help. I really like helping people with skills. So the last few weeks we've been getting ready for mountain bike season. A lot of people started doing that and then in and out of the gym here. We're back in Collingwood after some time away for camps and stuff. So we've been working with some of the beginner intermediate ladies at the gym and yesterday I had them doing all sorts of crazy balance work. So we're going to talk about whether you should do crazy balance work today and what that actually means. Yeah, and tomorrow I'm actually teaching my first ever spin class at the gym, so that's kind of exciting. Yes, if you're looking for spin classes, Molly may or may not be in it, depending <laughs> on how this debut goes. Yeah, we'll see. I've got a playlist all ready to go. It's not my dream punk rock spin class, but it's a, it's a start. I'm pretty excited about it. I'll be bouncing around all, all 6.15, bright and early. It's definitely the least or the thing I like the least about fitness classes. The 6.15 a.m.? No. uh, Yeah, maybe that's what I don't like as much. But no, that's okay. Once you get into it, it's okay. But the music, programming music is like, one, I think quite important, but then two, very difficult for a group of people without like shared musical interests. Yeah, So it might actually be better to program classes rather than picking like the focus to have you know, this is punk rock spin, as you say, and then you just would go to the class based on the music. Yeah, exactly. Like, I was talking to our friend Betsy, and I said I wanted to run, like, a 90, or movies of the 90s spin class, where it's, like, straight up soundtracks. Like, we do the Clueless soundtrack one day. Oh, you're doing, like, complete soundtracks. Yeah. Or, like, themed classes, like, yeah, hit mu- hit movie, or, yeah, hit movie soundtracks from the 90s, and, you know, you got some Clueless in there, and some Lethal Weapon, and whatever else. I think DJs would go well. Like, I, I wish I knew a local DJ that we could, I could just partner with, and we could, you know, you, I wish you're I basically had... paying for, like, a concert, but also a workout, and, yeah. but then it would be, like, we'd be back and forth, because I'd have to, like, play off him and his DJ mm. expertise with my spinning expertise. So, as we say fairly frequently, if Jeremy Powers is listening. <laughs> yeah, if j Pow ever wanted to come, you know, it'd be... You know, we could make beautiful music, spin spin some tracks, Actually, so to speak. Spinning, of... we could play off of the spinning oh, of God. the... Oh, God. You're uh, fired. Yeah. Actually, one of the only podcasts I have saved on my iPod, and it's it's not because it's, like, the most fantastic podcast in the universe, it's because I don't, my iPod no longer connects to my computer, is Jeremy DJing a set on a Cycling Jams podcast. With Cycling Jams. I've, I, I, that's probably not even the right name. It was mm. years ago. We're like talking, like, 10 like years it's old. It's like a podcast that you listen to to get your beat. Yeah. Mm. So I might just play that tomorrow. Yeah, I guess. Boom, done. Anyway, I'm I'm really chipper this morning. I went to 6:30 sunrise yoga, feeling pretty pretty good. I woke up and installed sealant into our uh, tires. And uh, PSA, actually, everybody, check the sealant in your mountain tis- bike tires. Well, any tires now. I almost uh, I was true. gonna get keen. I had to do some road bike repairs too, and I almost switched over to tubeless. But I won't. I'm not making that switch yet. Yeah, so anyone that's pulling their mountain bikes out of the garage for the first time all season, uh, don't forget that stuff does, in fact, dry up. Yeah, I mean, or it's been used, right? Like, I mean, yeah. especially on more burly stuff, like, if you're if it's working, then it's working, right? So at some point, you're, you're, you're losing a little bit in those as it seals. So that's anyhow, a that's point. a fairly specific example, but why don't we, do we have anything else? Oh, no. Not so much. I'm halfway done with yoga teacher training. I'm actually going to be posting on the outdoor edit uh, just a little bit about sort of where I'm at right now and what I'm getting out of it. I'm doing a piece for Nylon on things I learned about yoga through yoga teacher training. Uh, So that's kind of going to be an interesting one. As it turns out, being super flexible does not actually mean that you're good at yoga. It's pretty interesting watching the instructor like not be impressed by the super bendy people and much more impressed by, you know, the people that are actually, like, doing the movements properly slash to the best of their abilities. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's that's interesting because that's really a lot of the questions we have today are, you know, is this good or bad? And it, it so often depends, right? Yeah. Like, should you stretch or should you foam roll or should you use low cadence drills are sort of a highlight of the topics today. And I mean, it sort of fits with that. Like, should you do this crazy yoga thing? And there's a lot of people where probably, you know, it's not getting deeper into that. It's actually learning to control it. That's exactly what it is, because we have a few people in the class who are, I mean, actually hypermobile, so they go beyond the normal range of motion, and so that means, like, yes, they, at a glance, they look beautiful in the postures, but the instructor is constantly telling them to, like, act, they're not actually doing them right. Right, and you'd see that in, like, a plank or something, or a downward dog, they could probably bend their elbows, like, past 180, like, past full straight. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's actually, you know, like, they'd be a good candidate to do some bicep curls or, exactly. or some supinated uh, pull-ups. Yeah, getting any of them to do pull-ups is... Anyway. <laughs> no, but you see that. I mean, in cycling, I, I remember working with a young lady who's actually doing quite well now, and she is quite quite mobile. Um, and so what, she would lock her arms out, and this is mountain biking. Yeah. And lock it out past 180. Um, so those elbow joints are just, you know, really getting exposed to a lot of you know, stress, really. And risk, right? Like, if you crash like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if it got bumpy, she would start bending her elbows, but that was sort of her, like, hangout position. Like, Mm -hmm. sort you know, when, you know, you picture your mountain biker with the elbows out sort of going down the trail or the road, um, you know, most people find sort of an end range ahead of that. Um, But she was able to find, you know, a place of resting and just hanging out on those tissues. And that's really the... What we're trying to not do is just hang out at the end range Mm -hmm. where it becomes sort of bony or, or, you know, sort of tendon ligaments holding on. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's been just sort of an interesting learning experience for me. Um, Well, Mm -hmm. so with that in mind, why don't we actually hit that that first question? Well, why don't we say thank you to Health IQ? little quick advertisement for Health IQ. It's life insurance. Active people like you and I. Um, if you haven't gone and checked it out, they they definitely support a lot of podcasts. And so even if you're maybe not in the market, but you're curious, you maybe just want to know, just go check it out. They have a really clean website. If you like websites, check it out. This is life insurance, by the way. <laughs> they have quizzes. See if it applies to you, if you're healthy, how healthy you are. So it's, maybe just go over. So that's healthiq.com slash CA pod. All right, there you go. Yeah, now and, back then, to and our... then well, and Wide Angle Podium. We should give them a shout. WideAnglePodium.com. Lots of good, mostly cycling podcasts, but there's some variety in there. There's bike shop uh, podcasts. There's what else is on there? But Adam Meyerson sometimes, if you're lucky. Yeah. I, I, I CX keep trying hairs. To say, oh my god! <laughs> this is why people say it just sounds like you just steamroll through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for you to throw in ep- your favorite show. I've been trying. Okay, what is it? CX hairs. Oh, okay. Well, that apologies. That already to... got steamrolled over. So yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks, honey. Apologies to everyone for this last minute and a half, and also for you know me just claiming I really like CX hairs more than any other one. There's a lot of awesome ones. We got to hang out as another favorite. Mm-hmm. They were also on our show. Oh, gosh, almost a year ago. I'm pretty sad. I'm missing sea otter. On, on that note, this will be the first year in like eight years that I won't be out at that bike festival. So that's kind of a bummer, but yoga training calls and I must go. That was a good segue out of promoting Wide Angle Podium, but there you go. You know what? I'm just going to turn your microphone off. Well, I would, but. All right. Well, let's get going here. Uh, so first question. All right. First question. Why are we still foam rolling? Yeah, I was offended by this. I don't know if, like, we need better curtains or, you know, how do they know that we are foam rolling? I, I are, just want to throw... Are they secretly foam rolling with us? No, I want to throw out that Peter thought that this said, why are you still foam rolling in a really aggressive manner? Well, and I was like, I mean, I like... I'm, in principle, I'm okay, but... But the... The exact phrasing of the question is, why are we still foam rolling? And I believe he means the collective we, not the royal we... Not someone's looking in our window with binoculars and seeing Peter do that. Just as a people, we're still... I'd say the athletic community is still pretty pro-foam rolling. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a fair statement. So where, why are we still foam rolling? 
Um, so I'll try and we have a few questions like this again. It's sort of good or bad. I, and generally it, it's in the middle. Nothing is always good. Nothing's always bad. Um, obviously there's some exceptions, but, um, generally, you know, things have an application, uh, and for a certain person and for a certain goal. So we'll just keep that in mind whenever you're sort of assessing, like, why are we, it might be that I like foam rolling and maybe I have, you know, muscles that, you know, feel better, the keyword being feeling, I don't know if we would necessarily even measure it, but after applying pressure with a roller or a, a ball, a massage ball of some type, um, you know, perhaps I get some sort of relief uh, in muscular tension or, you know, things don't hurt as much afterwards. And so I see a benefit from it. Um, you know, perhaps I'm able to relax after a workout or before bed by using the foam roller or using, uh, again, a trigger point ball or something like that. Um, so for me, it might be quite a positive, but for someone who's never included it, is it, you know, achieving their goals, they're not injured, is there a rationale to include foam rolling? I don't know that we know that. I don't think so. I don't see why, you know, with all the options we have for how to use our time, especially for busy people like the ones I work with, I, I wouldn't just randomly decide that someone needs to start doing that. Um, unless, again, they had, they were someone with, you know, some knee pain that seemed like it was, you know, related to perhaps a, a, a quote unquote tight muscle or a sore muscle. Um, or someone who needed to sort of just chill out a bit, but isn't someone who's going to sit there and meditate or something like that, right? Um, so I think it, there's maybe an answer in there somewhere. I think the other sort of thought experiment is, you know, are you okay with massage therapy? You know, or, or going to some a chiropractor for some sort of, you know, ART style, you know, trigger point therapy. If you're okay with that, then it's an easier jump to think over to foam rolling or, or, you know, a trigger point ball, massage ball, where then you're actually in control and you might not even be a better judge of how much pressure you need and exactly where you need versus at least a lot of therapists. Some therapists are amazing and somehow find those spots and the right pressure, but not all. So I think the other way to think about that is if you are okay and not questioning that, then you're probably okay with foam rolling in principle. Yeah, I think we can also say, like, kind of, I guess, the old school methodology of, like, here's the one foam roller and here's, you know, the two ways that you're rolling. And, I mean, if you you see this in the gym all the time, right, people who finish their workout and, like, feel like they should foam roll. So they basically just sit on the foam roller and, like, that's about it. Like, Yeah, exactly. And, and Just kind of really low, like, there are just better ways to get use out of the foam roller slash even just you know using different types of foam rollers different like you were saying trigger point things you use the lacrosse ball a lot i use the foam roller in a different way i use see it but i think chest. that's i think that's the question mark is a there's a lot of different things that we're grouping under this foam rolling or self myofascial release perhaps is a bigger umbrella we could put on that so basically applying pressure to some point on your body using another thing, which could, I think, include your, your th own thumbs, um, like self massage is pretty much the same thing. Right. Um, so I, I think it could mean a lot of things. Like you say, some people just lay on a foam roller. So is that foam rolling or is that like some sort of yoga balance exercise? Right. So we have to be careful again, when in any study that we're looking at too, like what is the actual thing that's being done? Are we just laying on it? Are we just rolling on it? Are we moving? Like, I really like sort of attack and floss where, um, if you think about putting, laying down on the foam roller with just one quad, all, you know, your other legs on the ground, you're sort of in a, a plank position on your elbows maybe, um, and you're rolling just sit your quad, your right quad, and then you could flex and extend your, your knee, so bring your heel to your butt and then straighten out your leg, and that's sort of tacking and flossing, so you find sort of that spot that's tender and then tack and floss. Now, is that the same as rolling maybe but now there's movement right now you're moving your quad in and out of a range of motion so there's a lot of different ways that's just one way that you could be doing that right so there's certainly a lot of ways you could be doing it i'm gonna say it comes down to purpose though like purposeful use of the foam roller so right. if you're just using it at the end of a thing and like you have no idea what you're doing and you're you know not feeling anything it's you don't feel like it's doing anything for you yeah, again, like if you don't, if there's no reason, and if I think more importantly, like if you don't have a system of like, 
uh, testing, I guess, if it's improving, if you still have an injury a week or, you know, a month later, and you're still foam rolling, you know, for hours a day, especially, you'll start seeing people get pretty excessive with it. Um, you know, beyond sort of like the recommendations are usually, you know, 30 seconds, maybe up to, you know, a couple minutes on a whole giant muscle, like a quad and sort of rolling the whole thing, but maybe 20 seconds on a given spot. Um, if you see people who are spending like hours and hours on this, then, you know, we have to be careful that we're not getting into, you know, sort of panic mode about an injury or something like that. And I've definitely seen that with low back pain and, you know, IT stuff and glute pain is often sort of mysterious sort of pains in the butt. So you have to be careful that people aren't sort of going too far off the, the deep end. But the example you gave of the end of classes where people sort of hang out, again, that's sort of, you know, we've worked really hard and now we're all sort of taking some deep breaths and laying down, you know, getting horizontal, again, focus on breathing, relaxation. What I really like is people sit on the foam rollers. Maybe they do. You, you were talking about sort of arching your, you know, working on your upper back. So doing some flexing and extending in the spine, um, maybe some twisting. But then hopefully people are talking, right? So you're getting deep breathing, some socialization, you're horizontal, right? So there's this sort of cool down aspect to what we're now calling foam rolling. So to I'll me, point out my example is way more of like the the local YMCA gym goers that like I just don't know if that's the worst their, thing. No, like they sit on their phone. Well, that's phone that's roller. the worst thing. I wouldn't necessarily say do that. Like again, I think when you're tying in deep breathing, laying down, you know. Just the people who run out the door to the next thing, I think we're missing that down regulation of that nervous system. And so we'll, we'll anyhow, we'll put, we've sort of rambled on there. We'll put a bunch of links to people like Greg Lehman, who's been on the podcast, um, who who has su- said he wants foam rolling to, to work and to be valid, but the research is not necessarily, you know, in, in that very mechanistic way is sort of lagging. But again, it's so tied into nervous system response. Um, and what we're actually trying to get out of it and how we're doing it. So it's not necessarily a yes, no, but I think it's very much, are you getting the response you want? Do you enjoy it? Um, and is it in, sort of within reason, right? So mm-hmm. that's foam rolling. Perfect. All right, let's, let's jump to balancing since we're along those lines. So the question is, what do we think about these quote unquote advanced balance and training elements that you see on social pages like on Nino Schurter, who's a pro mountain biker, for those of you who don't follow mountain biking, uh, he can often be seen doing crazy balancing things in the gym where he's doing stuff like juggling. We'll throw a video into the show notes. So if anyone wants to see what he's doing, you can look at that. Uh, Is there any value to that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, There's a few things like I I always come back to nothing's good or bad. So if you want to learn to juggle, that's a movement. You know, that's a skill. It's not going to win you a mountain bike race. Uh, I I mean, but it won't lose you one. I mean, again, going back to foam rolling, Uh, do we see negatives? But we only have a limited time to train. Right. So if I'm spending five hours a week on my juggling and not on the trail, well, that's going to lose me my mountain bike race. And it is. It's an interesting dilemma is how we spend our time. Right. So, again, foam rolling someone who has limited time to train and no apparent injury should they be foam rolling when they only have four hours to train and they want to do well at a mountain bike race we know that foam rolling is not going to increase your mountain bike performance that's been not directly shown but no performance aspect is necessarily improved by foam rolling at least not conclusively so going to juggling or balance a lot of people do not have great balance Does that apply to mountain biking? I could see some sort of mechanism there where if you fall over on your mountain bike, you can't balance in the spot on mountain biking. But I would say, can you track stand on your mountain bike? Um, And then before we get to advanced, he did use the word advanced, can you stand on one leg and, you know, pass something between your hands while you're standing on one leg? Can you stand on one leg and, you know, do a one-legged deadlift type thing, you know, an airplane, you know, a variety of yoga maneuvers. There's a lot of things that we can include in your active warm-up. You know, we're always doing leg swings and stuff like this. Um, I've never been huge on sort of the balance platforms and stuff like that, but I think what I see is people who are generally pretty athletic and have mastered things like a a lunge or, again, a one-leg deadlift, a deadlift, a squat, um, different things like that, sort of the, the, the basics of weightlifting and movement, they usually, if you show them a balance thing, you know, they might be a little unstable standing on a basu for, you know, a couple minutes, but if you give them three reps of it, by the end of it, they're quite good. 
so the people always want the like crazy flashy things they see on Instagram, but often if you actually like tried to stand on one leg and do like the airplane, I think everyone knows like a one legged Romanian deadlift airplane and yoga. It's you told it was warrior three in yoga as well. A lot of people do not do that very well. Right. Especially if then you do something like a twist or something like that while you're there, or you have to look behind you, close your eyes. Like there's so much you can do just in your general day, brushing your teeth, standing on one leg, you know, calf raises going up onto your toes. Um, there's so much you can do. So I don't think there has to be advanced, but I think single leg work, unilateral work is very important. And then on your bike or your specific sport, doing balance and trials for cyclists, um, you know, very important. Riding with one arm, no arms, one foot, you know. Yeah. I mean, it should just be pointed out that Nino Scherter is like a tremendous basketball player and apparently juggler. But he's already conquered pretty much everything you can on the mountain bike yeah. already. Yeah, and so we'll he... link. Thank you uh, for including those links and sort of the context of the question. But a lot of the stuff isn't that crazy that he's doing. Like he juggles, but he might have already liked juggling, right? And and he's quite advanced. And the Swiss have some like crazy things usually. And they're very, you know, the Swiss ball comes from Switzerland. So they're somewhat biased in that, right? But if you look closely, you know, the videos may be oriented in a certain way. But there's also he's doing a squats with quite a bit of work right so how much of that balance stuff comprises his actual training it's probably a very very small percent right but essentially he's doing like ab rolls you know they have a crazy thing that's like a bicycle that you pedal with your hands that sort of rolls away and you do uh like an ab roll or i don't know how to explain that better you sort of roll out to like a plank position an extreme plank position so it's kind of like a tiny unicycle that like pedals with your, with your hands. hands while you're on sort of your knees although he might have been on his feet it was pretty impressive anyhow so it's all the stuff he's doing looks impressive but he's also just a tremendous athlete right so the message i think for most of us is yeah keep progressing your standard movements and we all those gymnastics and things like that will keep progressing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So don't stress if Nino can juggle and you can't. Yeah, and just keep the you know the goal. The goal is the, a lot of times the distraction is we see something on Instagram and we want to go do it because it seems like crazy and you know cool, but then we lose sight of that actual goal, right? Which might just be pedaling a bicycle up a hill you know, without anything flashy, but we just need to get up that hill. And that's the goal for now. Right. Like, I mean, I'm as good. Like I've wanted to master handstands and that's, we're probably going on six or seven years here. And I keep getting a little better here and a little better there, but I am not putting a lot of time into that. Right. I think the fact that we've resisted buying a slack line is like probably one of my proudest achievements. I would love to be better at slack lining, (laughs) but I also value my arms working and so I, we don't do a ton of slacklining. Someday. It's weirdly like this really proud thing because you see it all the time and like all of the No, like, we're the target audience. Yeah, like the hashtag van life, like outside always has it in like the things you need in your van for camping or like the five things you should definitely take camping and slackline always comes up and I'm like, maybe this will be the day I buy it, but I haven't so far and I'm pretty proud. Yeah, so we'll include those links. I think, you know, just keeping an eye on the goal um and what like there's some pretty smart strength coaches out there who are working some with some quite high-end players you know in the hockey and different team sports and then also you know i guess cycling and and endurance sport but a lot of times it's pretty fundamental like the lunge the squat yeah once you actually back it off and just look at what movements are actually happening Mm -hmm. kind of take away some of the crazy stuff around yeah and that was like maybe 10 years ago like that functional training you know quote unquote functional really just sort of meant crazy all over the place training right and i don't know it's it's one of those things the coach clance is one guy we haven't had him on but um he trained some he has trained like some really high level hockey players and his thought was, you know, if you have to lift a barbell up over your head explosively, that's really, really heavy. And then you have to get out of the way because you screwed up. Like that's really the best agility training, balance training, you know, to pull it off or to get out of the way when you screw up because the the, the risks are, are high, right? Uh, please don't try that at like the YMCA or your local gym. No, but his point was if you lift heavy weights, you learn how to how to move quickly and you learn how to control Sort yeah. of b- and balance yourself, right? Yeah. So. 
Okay, perfect. Um, next question, and this is a pretty good one since up here where we are in Ontario, the trails are definitely not rideable yet on the mountain bike, but mountain bike racing actually technically starts in three days. So, mountain bike workouts on the trainer. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think this even applies to if you can't do you know, a perfect version of the workout you want to do or the sport you want to do, you know, you're a swimmer, you're not at the pool. So we had um, Sheila on there a couple podcasts ago and she talked about some band work and and different things like that you can do not in the pool that are going to benefit. So specific to this example, it is pretty common in Canada, but you'll also have, you know, if it's rainy or you're stuck in the city and there isn't great trails or it's Saturday and you know, the trails are overrun with people often happened in California, I remember. So we had to sort of start shifting to doing most of our mountain biking during the week in the area we were in, um, just so you wouldn't run into people, right. Or have to pause for people constantly. So I think the one thing I start having people do is going outside on their mountain bike, because I sort of had this realization last year, actually, a lot of mountain bike races, you know, unless you're doing like a longer marathon race, like especially XCO now is just, if you think about the amount of time that's on double track or grass or, you know, paved starts, you know, especially at the high end. Now, if you watch Fontana and Benelli's this weekend and Fontana was last weekend, there's a fair bit of open section on a lot of courses, you know, a lot of just basically climbing on a grassy hill in your local park probably has like a similar grassy hill in a park. Um, So I think when you think about, okay, well, I have to be ready and there's all these different parts of a mountain bike race I have to be ready for. So there's a start, it's usually on pavement or gravel, like pretty high speed. You know, there's going to be a couple grassy climbs of some type, even, you know, a, a technical course like Mount St. Anne has a bunch of grassy climbs. Um, I know I have to be on my mountain bike and I know my mountain bike tires have to hold air and my brakes can't rub and my gears have to shift and not shift into the spokes. Um, I need to be ready to clip into my pedals at the start. I need to be able to stand up and do a bunny hop. So when I start listing those things that go into a mountain bike race, yes, the, the rock gardens and the technical single track you know, maybe that's going to be hard to get to, but how many parts of that performance could you practice in a local park using, you know, a log, you pull out of the forest, the little hill on it, the little start stretch on the driveway, um, you know, parking blocks can be log hops, you know, a couple cones could be corners or just the trees in the park, maybe, um, you know, or, or simply just riding your mountain bike on a gravel path and hopping whatever you see on the trail. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I think sometimes we forget that we can do 80% of what we need to do and be pretty prepared. And no, it's not the same as riding your local mountain bike trail. It's not nearly as fun. Uh, But neither is racing, so. Well, I mean, it's just what are you preparing for, right? So that's, I think, a a practical thing to consider is how can you make your workout like that? You know, if you had like a a 3 by 10 you were going to do on the trail, maybe you have to do it maybe as like 30-30s on the trainer or on the gravel path or out on the road on your mountain bike. But I think a getting on your mountain bike, just so you know, that part of the day is taken care of. Like, you know, your bike is working. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're not new to mountain biking completely, like you'll remember how, and if you're in an area like we are, like very few people have had much mountain biking. So there's that too, right? Everyone's a little nervous at the first race. Yeah. I mean, I think we'll, we'll add the caveat of get out on your mountain bike at least once before you race it. Not yeah. necessarily on trails. Like, well, and again, it's hard. It, people work and weather's crummy. And but back to that checking the tire pressure and sealant and all that. Don't don't make your first mountain bike of the year your race. Yeah. Okay. Well, that kind of leads into early races, and uh, you have written in here damaging equipment slash confidence. So oh yeah. So are we damaging equipment and confidence, or are we? I think so. Um, it's, it, it's tough. I always encourage it, It's tough. I sort of have a double standard. Like I, I get very grumpy if people add races at the last minute, because I am a big believer that we should be preparing specifically mentally and our equipment and our training, even for lower priority races and the odd time, like, yes, I'll show up, you know, at a low key weekly race or a low key weekend race as is the case this coming weekend, I'm going to do sort of hopefully a race, but we're in this dicey period where it's just a mud going to be a mud bath. Potentially it's going to be snowy. Potentially Um, the trails are barely ready. 
And so you sort of have to weigh, you know, especially a lot of people have new bikes in the spring and then the conditions like we're in the, this past weekend was below freezing and people are doing gravel race and it's muddy and it's sloppy and windy and it's cold and you're wearing so much clothing. And so if that was like your key race, then you should be ready for that and go and do it and perform and be ready. Cause that's probably, you probably knew that those spring races likely are going to be sort of epic spring classics and that's fine that's your goal but if your goal is in june or july and this is like a c priority race or just a prep race type thing you know you were hoping to get on the trails the mistake i think people make is they go they trash their bikes like i don't know how many derailers went into spokes and the whole drivetrain is gonna have to be redone because it got all iced up and then derailers are bent and frames get cracked or like you know, just massacred from like stuff getting into the wheel and just hitting the frame. And then the confidence gets shot because you have a crummy race, right? Or you feel like, but because it's windy below zero, you're wearing so much clothes, you know, no one's eating or drinking, but it's a three hour race. Um, so it's just, it's one of those things that you sort of have to make. It's almost a game day decision, as much as I hate that to just, you know, is it worth it today? You know, is it worth the cleanup, the expense? You know, maybe it is. If that's your, if you're a spring classics rider and you're prepared for that and you have all the, the key equipment and that's how you're going to spend your equipment, that's great. But um, that's been sort of a thing I've seen a lot of is sort of that game day decision of is it worth it, right? Yeah, I think pinning any kind of confidence boost or drop on any kind of early season racing is... A mistake a lot of people make because I mean on both sides of the coin it's a bad thing because if it's early season and you do really well you know sorry but that might be because a lot of people made the game day decision to not go yeah and I mean a lot of these races are not high level races right yeah or I mean you might have like pushed yourself a little harder than everybody else but like now you're going to be busted for three weeks of recovering or whatever so don't don't go into it looking for that boost in confidence. And at the same time, if you go into it and it doesn't go well, it shouldn't wreck your confidence for the whole season for those exact same reasons. You've got weeks before your race, you know? You yeah, they're sort of shakeout races, right? Like they, they are sort of the practice races or um, training races. I don't really like the phrase training races, but really, I mean, that's what I'm going into this weekend is I'm hoping Saturday to get a hard mountain bike race in. And my only goal is to you know, go for the whole shot because that's always sort of my training objective in especially lower key races because I'm not great at it. I was going to say because it doesn't happen in the big ones. No, but just, and, and to me that even the whole shot is just like make the start like five, ten minutes really hard. Um, so that's a training goal for me. And if it's a really hard five or ten minutes, it's not really hard to make a start. So like I achieve that training objective and then just go through the motions of a race, right? Fuel myself, dress appropriately, you know, jump some giant logs that other people don't jump because this race has big, big logs, which will be sweet. Do some good skids, get some air, you know, and the result, especially in this one, doesn't really matter, right? Like it's it just put in a good training effort. Um, and then Sunday, I hope to get out and do another big sort of endurance ride. So it is essentially a training race, but I'm going to show up prepared, but I'm also not hanging you know, my, my, how I'm determining my fitness or my, my self-worth on this. Right. Um, it's just sort of informing, I guess, how things are going, where legs are at and shaking out the bike and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was some good points there around sort of the confidence and sort of the, the, the goal of the race, especially when you're new to stuff. I've seen that, you know, we were just on a camp with some younger athletes and moving up a category. A lot of people have moved up to a new category, even in your age groupers, you know, to an expert. Right. And so sometimes it's that, you know, you're, you've got this big expectation, you've trained all winter. And a lot of people do put a ton of stress into that first couple because it's their unknown, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know, it's like get one under your belt. Like just be glad you finished and you put in, you know, a lot of times it's a longer race, a faster race. So to me, that's success, right? And so it, it was interesting having some conversations around that, just like, no, this race went fine. You know, there's... No one expected you to win, you know, in your first expert race or your first whatever race, right? You got to get some under your belt. Mm -hmm. 
I always use the analogy, like some of the younger pro men who come in and they expect after like one, once one winter of training to be like winning. And I'm always like, what if you like told Jeff Kabush that you were going to beat him, you know, after one winter of training. Right. And then it just seems ridiculous. Right. I'm just imagining like Nina Scherter juggling balls as he walks away <laughs> laughing at you. <laughs> yeah. Like you, I'm, 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 I want go down, I train as hard as I can. And then I'm going to beat Nino after three months. Right. It just sounds ridiculous, but that's, I think what we do to ourselves sometimes is we're going to move up to a category where there's potentially people that have been racing at the front of that category for years right? Maybe even race to lead and now they race age group or so they have like 15 years of high and you know, so you're, the cards are somewhat stacked against us. Not that they're, it's insurmountable, but give yourself a couple races to beat these people, right? Like get into it, get rolling, you know, have that target race, build towards it. And then you can, you know, how to put them all on the table, but get some in the bank for yeah. sure. <laughs> all right, moving on. Yeah. Uh, personal favorite topic. Uh, the question is, can you talk about any science or evidence for low cadence work or muscle tension in regards to climbing on a bike? Could this be replaced with better gearing to allow for increased cadence? I will say I am hugely biased and my first response was, why would you increase cadence on purpose? Mm. Uh, but I have a terrible natural cadence. So again, we'll put a bunch of links. Um, this person should probably look into quadrant analysis is a tool they may find interesting, especially if they have any sort of mathematical leanings. Um, I always find it quite confusing, but it is a very good tool. What is quadrant analysis? Uh, quadrant analysis basically takes all your power data and then also all your cadence data and it clusters it into four quadrants. Mm. So there's low cadence, low force, low cadence, high force, so high wattage, like high, you're pushing down really hard, yeah. but at a low RPM. And then there's a uh, high cadence, high force. So that would be like a higher cadence, but pushing hard. And then high cadence, low force. So just spinning easy. And the classic example is like spinning in a, a group drafting where you're just sort of moving your legs, but you know. My quadrants would have none in that bottom one. And the interesting thing about quadrant analysis is it's relevant to your threshold power. And then also you can adjust sort of what low and high means. And that's ultimately, again, nothing is good or bad. That's sort of our framework for today. So Molly tends to pedal with a relatively low cadence. Um, but that doesn't mean that she can't pedal at 90 RPM. But her averages usually are on the low side. And that comes from a bit of triathlon background, a bit of... Um, a dad with really low cadence and yeah I mean 100% you rode around people with lower cadence um, and then also I mean you, your frequency of training all, for cycling often isn't as high but you also came from cyclocross which any off-road discipline tends to be a little lower um, and then also just certain people are slower we'll say slower twitch that's not what I mean but slower they don't move quite as fast and this is all relative terms so for Molly, you can tell that I'm just like glaring at him. So Molly <laughs> say she averages 75, which is in cycling terms, relatively low for an experienced cyclist. Most cyclists do trend towards that classic sort of 90 RPM. Not that 90 RPM is the best. Um, but this is sort of the heart of the discussion is Molly has trained this for years and years and years and somehow makes it work in most situations she's racing crit races this year so we're gonna see how we'll say how she deals with accelerations but she also may be fine like she may be able to accelerate that gear and stay on wheels and she may compensate with her tactical understanding of the group or or whatever right so people figure out a way the jurassic park quote life will find yeah, a way I was just gonna Ian say. Malcolm applies here so Again, you, you have to be very careful ever saying Molly should go do super high cadence intervals or must hold 90 RPM because we don't know that that even necessarily will help. If I see, and I do see this sometimes, so we do work on this, but Molly getting maybe missing a wheel or an acceleration, like someone sprints and they the cadence accelerates and she has the reaction this is very common of shifting so she's at 70 rpm and shifts harder to accelerate that's like putting your car into fifth to accelerate on a hill and hearing that like and the engine dying right 
So there's some skill of shifting in there. But again, I don't know how much of that is your ability to pedal faster versus the skill of shifting. You may very well just figure that out, the order of the shift versus the cadence acceleration. Mm -hmm. So again, there might be more tactical, technical aspects to work on there. So again, we're getting to our foam rolling debate where it's not as simple as low, good, high, bad, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So where do we go from here? Uh, basically, my my read of the question and listening to you talk, uh, my suggestion would be if the guy really hates low cadence and finds it despicable enough to ask for like scientific evidence to like prove that he absolutely has to do it, I'd say he's probably better off not really doing it or at least well, not stressing about it. I'd say. Yeah, shifting to a, a better gear to maintain the higher cadence. So I think he's brought up a valid point. So th there's a couple elements here. A, your theory is if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. Not not 100%, but just Well, it, it, it depends sure. though. If we're a recreational cyclist and we just want to go out every day and there's one mean hill, then put an Eagle cassette on your bike and get a 50 massive thing on there. And yeah, spin up that climb and then go about your business. There's, if you don't care, if it's more about the feeling or just getting up the hill, sure, you could definitely do that. The question though is when we look at that sort of force we apply to the pedal versus the cadence, if someone doesn't like muscle tension, my experience is that by exposing them to short, so somewhere between sort of five seconds and maybe two minutes. I don't often go much over two minutes, but basically maximal effort. So this might be your stomp efforts. Getting towards a muscle tension, muscle tension intervals tend to be in that sort of six to eight range uh, for minutes or even longer. And that to me is getting more moderate intensity. But I think if you think about maximal output, so sprints essentially, um, and dealing with that, again, mentally dealing with that, neuromuscularly dealing with that tension at your hip. These are seated generally, um, but also would include standing sprints. Um, I, th I find that if the Molly's polar opposite person, the spinner, tends to find it quite overwhelming, like people crying in the ditch overwhelming from doing like five by one minutes at, say, 60 RPM and max output um, and holding that RPM. It's a nice RPM because you can just watch your seconds count down if you don't have a cadence sensor and just go one cadence, one pedal stroke for each. Basically stomps at that point. Well, stomps are slightly different. Let's not get convoluted here. But you're essentially stomping the pedals down for a minute up, the, up a pretty big hill. Um, and, and what I find is it's almost a more mental experiment where you're learning to deal with that low cadence, not because you're going to necessarily use that cadence, you can have great gears, your Eagle cassette on your road bike with full compact. So you could have like the easiest gear known to man, but then you'll be able to deal with the muscle tension. So hopefully you can pedal whatever gear you choose harder. So you can push down harder in whatever gear. So the theory is that we could use these lower RPM drills or intervals to push your tolerance slightly lower so if you're a person who can only spin at 100 there is the potential that you're missing the opportunity to push down and go faster and you definitely see that the person who's barely moving forward and spinning away yeah usually there's a muscular limitation now could you do that in the gym uh, probably you can include just not a specific to that so mm -hmm. I personally, in my coaching, like I find it much more uh, almost mental exercise sometimes and, and use it to sort of just pull that cadence down a bit if it does seem on the high side to me. But again, we would be wanting to see then those measures, those performance objectives, whether that's the race result or, you know, a CP20 or a, or a CP whatever you believe in, shorter duration, you know, your two to five I'm agnostic about my CPs. two to five minute power increasing so that then we know that that sort of worked. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that that explains it again. It's not good or bad, but I think you need to be ready for that. Um, one general rule that I just alluded to, though, is in that quadrant, we talked about the sort of four quadrants, the one that generally you will see people 
not do. You'll see some, it, it seems like it tends to be European coaches who are older. And I, I don't know, and I've seen some really talented people do this. Um, but the low force, so your endurance pace, like comfortable all day pace done at like very low. So under 60 RPM, sometimes even like 40 RPM. So extended durations hmm. that generally is not thought to be very beneficial. Um, that's sort of like the beach cruiser coffee shop pace. So generally people will avoid that. Um, so Generally, that's why you're going to see endurance riding done at, you know, that 85, 90 or higher cadence. You know, if you're spinning very lightly in the group, higher cadence. If you're spinning up in a crit, you're in a road race, you're going to see a higher cadence at TT, generally a higher cadence. Um, and then again, sometimes we have to climb hills and we run out of gears. And then you're going to see a lower high force cadence. But it's hard to see a performance situation where you're going to be at of low cadence mm -hmm. so the general wisdom which may or may not be true depending on your goals you know a single speeder maybe isn't in this case depending on how they're setting up their bike um, you know again recreational person can do whatever they want but the thought is that those are the sort of three quadrants we want and you leave that low low quadrant sort of alone oh <laughs> which would be technically molly's preferred pace <laughs> My preferred quadrant. I love that quadrant. Okay. So hopefully that is something. Perfect. Okay. Let's hit this last question here. Um, we have someone who's moving up from a century ride to a 175 mile ride for one day. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, apologies if I say he or she incorrectly on this one. We could use they. They. Uh, they say um, they're comfortable training for and feeling properly for a century ride, but are a little freaked out by the idea of almost doubling that. Um, so they have till August to get ready for this. Um, they're thinking it's going to take around 13 to 15 hours and so correct in saying that's a long time to be in a chamois. Uh, so they want some fueling tips, some and some general, I guess, training and comfort tips. So this is sort of right in our uh, wheelhouse, I guess. Yeah. Why don't you, do you want to do any? Yeah, I'll hit it first. Obviously, saddle choice is extremely important the longer your duration. So I assume you already have a decent saddle because you're doing 100 milers. So that's, that's a positive. Um, as far as like long time in the chamois, yeah, definitely is. So make sure you're starting with a chamois that's, you know, not old and haggard, is definitely washed properly, all that fun stuff. But the other thing is, I don't know if you use chamois cream yet. Uh, I assume most century riders, I feel like, do. Um, one thing I've seen for longer distances, like the 175, is actually to carry some with you. Um, I know Shammy Butter has individual size packets, so I'm a fan of maybe just having one in your pocket, so midway through, because you're probably going to have to get off your bike and use a washroom at some point in time during that event, so I would reapply once or twice. Um, you know, not a ton. Don't like slather it on like crazy, but that'll, you know, kind of ease some of the skin issues you're going to have. Um, but a, a distance like that, that's where stuff like standing every couple of minutes, even from the very beginning, is going to be really important for comfort in general. So every couple of minutes, even if you're not on a hill, just stand up, get some air in there. It'll just change your position. Yeah, get some blood even, flow. Even the hands, right? Yeah, blood flow back, your hands are going to be less inclined to go numb, your feet are going to be less inclined to go numb, your back's going to thank you, especially, you know, if you start doing that at mile one, by mile 160 or whatever, your back is going to be a lot happier than if you'd stayed completely stationary for the first 70 miles or so. So, yeah, just trying to kind of keep that movement going in. Um, as far as fueling properly goes, um, that's such a long day. I think one of the biggest things you can do is make sure you're either okay with a super, you know, one track kind of diet for that day, or that you have enough variety to kind of get past some of those like, oh, I just can't do another gel kind of situations. Luckily for longer rides like this, you can generally do more of like, 
bars, even some like jerky to break things up. And, you know, you can really get a little crazier with your food because you're probably not, you know, really taxing your heart rate or digestive tract that much. Yeah. I mean, the, I think you are sort of in that thing where you need to find something you tolerate, but then you need to be ready to sort of provide some sort of novel food that's going to excite you about eating, especially if you're not someone who can just sort of down, you know, some sort of endurance fuel a lot of the time. Um, But that's, you know, you're an experience. If you've done century rides, Mm -hmm. um, I assume that's rides, not just maybe one century. Um, But in any case, you know, you you must have some idea of what generally works for you. Um, You know, within sort of those rules of thumb, uh, they mention fuel your ride so that you'll be able to sort of look up a lot of those nutrition rules of thumb in that book. Oh yeah, book. that's that's right. Just pl- I, I completely missed the fact that they plugged my book for me. Right. Uh, Feel Your Ride has a lot of stuff in here. Um, the other thing I was actually going to suggest is a lot, I never did this when I was a century rider, but I did it in Ironman is the bento box on the bike. So when I was doing centuries with my team, I would just cram a bunch of stuff in my pockets. Um, but then for Ironman, we both had bento boxes just on the top tube, and that gives you a little more space for snacks. It makes them easier to reach. So if you're someone who's, you know, maybe not so good with like the getting the stuff out of your pocket, uh, that's great. And also you can just have more variety in there because you have a little more room. Yeah. I mean, in triathlon, the thing is you don't want to have to fill your pockets. Um, but depending on what you have whether you're self-supported on this uh that may be i guess that's a good question yeah i'm not sure how self-supported this is it doesn't say a lot of people who do these long rides do like the bento box especially on the road right i can the mountain bike stuff seems a little crazy to me to have it on the top tube like that but a lot of people use it for even things like leadville and stuff and yeah it's just easier you know to get the food out and to pick what you feel like eating right if you can kind of like open the bento box a little bit and be like okay i want the jerky now not the cliff bar Mm -hmm. grab that and you're not just kind of like reaching in your back pocket and aiming for whatever um i think you know you know this from centuries but starting to fuel and hydrate early and often versus waiting till mile 75 to get started Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it's August, so it'd probably be pretty hot. Yeah. Too. So making sure you're training in the heat um, as best you can. I think the biggest, like the biggest worry, seems to be more around just the fact that it's almost double the distance. But I will say, I think you know everyone that's ridden kind of thinks about this. You know, when you first go from twenty miles to forty miles, it seems insurmountable, but you do it. When you go from 40 to 70, seems insurmountable, but you do it. 70 to 100, insurmountable, but you do it. Um, You know, as you get better and better at riding, you know, if you can do a century and, you know, you're finding that not a massive challenge, honestly, 175, I bet you're going to be fine. Um, Pacing might be the only other thing I'd think about. Yeah, just being a little conservative. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, the difference, um, you know, you're so aerobic already in a century. So if you finish that, you know, without just, you know, going straight onto IV fluids and having to be carried off the finish line, you know, it's really just a little bit more conservative, um, you know, saving a bit for that second half, making sure you're, as you say, fueling early. Um, you know, it, it'll be slightly less intense, but it's really not the intensity difference isn't that big between the two. Mm-hmm. Um so it's just just being careful with that. Uh, the only, I guess, the last thing I'll say is like, pat, like, plan to eat more than you think you're gonna eat. I know my mistake. I'd say I made in Ironman this August was I brought enough. I brought the food that I thought I needed for the bike, and when I still had about an hour to ride, I was on my last gel, and I was thinking like, oh crap, I should have brought another bar or another gel or something. Uh, so, you know, you might be hungrier than you expect to be. So just kind of prepare for that in terms of the fueling. Mm. So, yeah, that's my that's my thoughts. But you've got this. Yeah, I think I think that's probably it. I mean, there's a lot of talk around the mixed carbohydrate and stuff, too. So I think just having sort of a mixed source of foods, which I assume they're they're doing, but, you know, not just one type of sugar. 
Yeah. Um, just to try and decrease that gut load. But again, if you test that in a couple training rides, um, the one thing, like I've had a bunch of people do Dirty Kanza, which is up in that 200 mile range. Um, and a lot of what they do, you know, because they're normal people with jobs and stuff. So they'll do weekend blocks often. So mm-hmm. do like a, a Friday night ride and then up early and do a big ride Saturday and then build towards doing like another big ride Sunday. And so what you end up is, you know, if you sort of time those rides relatively well, you know, in Friday, you maybe go out and do whatever's, I don't know what's reasonable on a Friday night, but say, what's 60K? 30, 30 miles? 40, 35. Yeah. So 35 miles or something like whatever you can fit in on a Friday. And then you're up, you know, relatively early Saturday, you know, then you can be doing, you know, a hundred miles or something on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Again, building into this, you know, it doesn't all have to be done weekend one. But then that way in that 24 hours, you're sort of getting in, you know, decent distance, but the recovery potential is maybe a little better and it maybe fits into life a little better as well. And then going in, you know, again, in training, I think it's okay to make life hard too. And, you know, we do this a fair bit, not to this extent that you're maybe going to do this, but, you know, you get home from a ride and then we'll maybe go for a walk or, you know, I have a couple clients who'll go and walk dogs, you know, go out on trail with their family or something like that, you know, get a quick meal and then maybe go and walk. Um, so you sort of extend it, but then sort of stack um, some of your, your family, social errands, that sort of stuff into, you know, a bit of an aerobic effort. Um, just because yeah. at some point you're going to have to fit in some of this extra time, right? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, as always, consummateathlete.com. You can leave us more questions. We do this every few weeks. So, you know, we like having the questions earlier. It gives us a chance to look for studies and kind of ponder our answers a bit. So the earlier you get them in, the better. Um, do it while you're, you're fresh right off this. Uh, again, thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you're checking out Health IQ. Uh, Make sure you're checking out the Wide Angle Podium Network and all the rest. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Hey, guys. Before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete, like you, save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash capod. That's C-A-P-O-D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could give us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.